This is Viticulture, where we share conversations with makers, growers, thinkers, and doers, folks who cultivate a good life. My name is Chris Missy, and I'm a lawyer turned winemaker in the Finger Lakes region of New York State, and I'm sitting down with great people in wine and other walks of life to hear their stories, learn their lessons, and take their advice on the perfect pairing. Today we're speaking with Todd Ikes, who, after 30 years working in industry as an electrician and training manager, partnered with his wife, Danny for their second act as vintners and operators of a Seneca Lake bed and breakfast. New Vines, the name of the winery and the bed and breakfast, produces my favorite Gruner Veltliner in the Finger Lakes, and their inn has garnered endless praise from guests who stayed with them. If you like this podcast, please be sure to rate us five stars in Apple Podcasts and like our videos on YouTube. It really helps with the ratings and in introducing new folks to the show. Don't forget to visit our website at viticulturepodcast.com and subscribe to our Substack, where you'll get show notes, transcripts, musings, and exclusive offers. We increasingly center our content around Substack's distribution channel and subscribers will have the chance to hear some exclusive podcasts delivered right to your inbox. You can also support the show at Substack and help us keep producing high-quality, in-depth content with makers and producers of all sorts. And though I'm not the best with social media, please check us out on all the major social media platforms. Additionally, if you or a maker you know is interested in being on the show in the future, Drop us a line at viticulturepodcast at gmail.com. And now, here's the show. Welcome to Viticulture, where we discuss ways to live a good life. I'm pleased to have Todd Ikes sitting in the interview chair today. Todd owns and operates with his wife, Danny, New Vines. It's a bed and breakfast on Seneca Lake. It's absolutely beautiful. And they also have a winery. It combines this unique aspect of what I love about this region, hospitality, welcoming folks, and also producing and making things and pursuing your passion. So Todd, it's really a pleasure to have you in the studio today. Thanks, Chris. It's a joy to be here. And, you know, it's interesting because when I first moved back from California to the Finger Lakes, my Uncle John had said, you know, I have a friend who's just starting a project down there. This was 2011. Um, You should you should go check it out. I think he's going to be doing some great things. And and he was right. (laughs) Uh, But you actually got to know my Uncle John as a baseball coach, right? That's correct, yeah. Um, his his son, Jason, and one of my boys played ball together, and uh, I've kind of been around baseball my whole life. Uh, I played in high school and college, and then coached our kids, our boys played, our girls played softball. Yeah. So it's, it's a big part of my life, and uh, met some wonderful people as, as a result. So I love baseball. Uh, if I'm not really a guy who's into sports, Mm -hmm. but if there is one sport that I was addicted to as a child and still love watching today, it's baseball. I had, uh, visions of becoming a baseball player. I was nowhere near athletic or coordinated enough to follow that through. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I grew up in Southern California, uh, loved the angels. That was our home team Mm -hmm. at the time. Wally Joyner was uh, Mm -hmm. a really big deal back then. And, Mm -hmm. And even, you know, the inspirational guys like Jim Abbott, yeah, uh, right. you know, just watching him play with one arm mm-hmm. and his ability to move so fluidly and throw that mitt back on his hand was yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. Chris, I think, you know, you had the dream that I think every American boy has. They want to be a major league baseball player at some point. I think we all had that dream. But yep. um, baseball is kind of a generational thing for me. I mean... My father played, I played, I coached our kids who play, and now our grandchildren are playing. Our, our oldest granddaughter is playing in high school, and a couple of our grandsons are playing. So it's, it's really exciting to see. It is. Uh, the thing I love about baseball is it, the way it does connect families like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, we can say it's quintessentially American, but it's also just so human. Those early memories of my dad putting a baseball on the tee. 
Mm -hmm. uh, doing a little t-ball camp, yeah. playing catch. It's so simple. But those are the memories that, that man, you just you don't lose those, yeah. and they're so valuable. That, that's correct. Um, I mean, I, I love having a catch with my grandkids. It's, it's just makes you feel so good. I yep. mean, it's just, it's just amazing to watch young kids pick up that game and learn it. And uh, I, I've made kind of a goal for myself. I want to be able to throw batting practice to every one of my nine grandchildren. <laughs> I've gotten, I think, six or seven of them so far. Uh, our youngest is only a few months old, so I'm going to have to wait a while. But And for the older ones, I actually had to build an out screen to throw from behind because they're starting to the ball back at me so fast that <laughs> my reactions aren't as good as they used to be. So. Yeah. The other thing I love about baseball is these sensory aspects that go with the game. Mm -hmm. The smell of the leather on the mitt. Mm -hmm. You know, the hearing the birds when you're out playing. Uh, one of the things that distracted me as a child was I was also really into bugs. And so, you know, I'd be playing right field and oftentimes trying to catch butterflies at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so a love of outdoors is something that unites baseball and wine in a lot of ways. Yeah. I'd love to hear kind of your story arc, Todd. Um, this is a second act for you mm -hmm. in a, a lot of ways. What were you doing before the idea came to you and Danny to open up the bed and breakfast and to start making wine. Um, yeah, going back, we uh, raised our family up west of Rochester in the Hilton Hamlin area. Um, I worked in a General Motors plant for 30 years. I was an electrician and a training manager there. Um, worked around all trades, which uh, taught me a lot of things, a lot, a lot of good skills that I've put to, put to work in many ways. But yeah. um, So a, a career in industry, um, and then... When we moved here to the Finger Lakes, uh, in, in getting some time for the B&B to get established, I also went to work at the bus plant in Penn Yan mm -hmm. as a process engineer. Um, learned some good things there that I, I can apply in my business as well. So, um, And it, then, yeah, go ahead. It's interesting that you're talking about the GM plant. <clears throat> We've lost a lot of jobs in this region mm -hmm. over the last 20 years as companies move their manufacturing in a lot of ways, Rochester is unique because we had these um, high tech for their time, yeah. Bosch and Lom, uh, Kodak, Xerox. There was also a lot of manufacturing, but it's also kind of a Rust Belt city mm -hmm. in some ways. What is interesting to me is you're part of this sort of transition generation of people who came from the industries that used to be here and, and be strong. Mm -hmm. And as they went away, kind of finding new homes for jobs and to live productive lives. Um, and, and particularly, you know, I, I love this idea of how important the trades are because we, we've lost that to a certain extent. Try building something and finding the labor to do it, the skills to do it, mm -hmm. and to do it right and well. Uh, in any event, uh, we can come back to that, but... I think that's just such a valuable skill set. And you're right, it translates into so many other jobs. Yeah. I was fortunate to work, you know, as an electrician, but I worked around plumbers and millwrights and carpenters and masons and and uh, basically learned skills from all those trades. And I've, I've done some of that work on my own and in many aspects in our home and our, in our business. So yeah. they're, they're very valuable skills. And like you say, there's some of that has kind of gone away. It's sad because there's it, it's a good occupation and there's there's a lot of opportunity there for people that want to learn a trade. It is. Part of it is, I mean, not to get too much of a social diagnosis here, but we we spent 30 years telling every kid that they had to go to college. Right. And it almost didn't matter, like, what you were going to study or what skills you could develop out of that. Mm -hmm. It was have that piece of paper, that's your ticket to a good life. Yeah. That is a promise that hasn't been fulfilled. Right. for a lot of millennials. Uh, and my hope is that in, in sort of the, the wake of what has happened, uh, the absence of good skilled jobs, like you can learn a trade and, and be on your way, whether it's with a union mm -hmm. uh, or through community college, right. and be making a really good living. Yeah. You, know? you, so. can. Yeah, you just jogged a memory. When I was, when I was working as an electrician, I, I used to join, help out with junior achievement, and we'd go to, into classrooms and talk to kids about careers. And, you know, you'd have teachers there 
telling kids they got to go to college. And I would hold up a journeyman card and say, you don't have to go to college. You can yeah. learn a trade and have a very good career. And, and you know, because college maybe isn't for everybody. So No, I mean, you, you become a journeyman plumber, journeyman electrician. You're fully employed at 21 with no student debt on your way to owning a home. Right. That is something that is now out of, uh, just totally out of the grasp of a lot of people with $100,000 in student loan debt. Right, yeah. It's part of that middle class that's kind of disappeared on us somewhat. It has. But these jobs are available, and uh, <laughs> we we need these people. My mm-hmm. dad's a plumber. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I uh, I was a kid, and I was on that college track. And he said, it's not too late for me to get you a plumbing truck. And this was in the 90s, and there was a mindset among people who were being told they had to go to college that like being in a trade was somehow lesser, Mm -hmm. right? Like the smart kids went to college. Uh, I I look back at that time and I say, gosh, I should have taken the plumbing truck. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I think you're doing okay where you're at, Chris. (laughs) Uh, In any event. So you're, you're working in trades, GM, Mm -hmm. uh, you decide in 2000, I'm guessing probably 2010, that you and Danny want to start a bed and breakfast. Yeah, it was 2007. Okay. Yeah. Um, my career at GM was coming to an end. They had a 30 year and you could, you know, retire. And I knew I wanted to do something different at that point in my life. I was only 48 years old. So yeah. um, we had traveled down here to the Finger Lakes starting in the early 80s. It's funny, we used to go to Cuca Lake because there were almost no wineries on Seneca Lake at the time. <laughs> And uh, we used to just love it down here. Um, the wines weren't all that good, but we didn't know any better at the time. And we just thought, well, what a cool place it would be to retire to here. And so we started having that conversation, Danny and I did. And, you know, how would you know, how would we make that work? And, okay, if we build a small house for the two of us, where would our kids come to visit, you know, to stay with us? And we had stayed in bed and breakfast, and we always thought it was kind of cool. Back in the day when they didn't have private baths, and yeah. so we kind of knew – what people were looking for when they travel and how to make them comfortable. And so we, we decided to jump off the deep end and give it a try. And, um, we designed our home to be a B and B and no, I, you know, people say, did you always dream about this? It was really more of a logistical thing for us. It was, we want to retire to this beautiful region. We have four children, you know, how do we make this work? And, and so we have a place for our kids to come home and we run it out to, travelers to the to the area when they're not there so <laughs> it's space for the kids and nine grandkids mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> that house gets really full and they were just home for the fourth of july for better part of a week and it is just so much fun um, yeah. just so much fun to have the kids and the grandkids there and there's you know to have a a vineyard and a winery that they can run around and play and enjoy and yeah. it, it's really special it really is now, from the beginning, Todd, was your goal to plant vines at the bed and breakfast? Yeah, my thought process was, you know, how could we move down into this beautiful up-and-coming wine region and not grow some grapes and make some wine? Yeah. Danny and I loved wine, but I had never grown a grape in my life. I mean, we grew up on a farm. You know, we did a lot of gardening, stuff like that, but never grew grapes. And uh, so, you know, I had a lot to learn, but uh, we just I just thought we couldn't move to this area and not grow some grapes. Yeah. And it's interesting because I look at next door to us is Red Tail Ridge with Mike and Nancy, and they had a plan. I mean, they, you know, they got their obscure red series, and they planted this beautiful vineyard, and, and I had no plan at all. I mean, I just look back and think, I was clueless. I mean, I just thought, let's plant some grapes. And yeah. and uh, there's some funny stories about some of the mistakes I made along the way. Um, actually, Nancy was over visiting one time when we had, planted a small part of her vineyard and she said, mind if I take a walk in the vineyard? And I said, yeah, sure, go ahead. And she comes back and she very politely says to me, she goes, Todd, do you remember when we were kids that show Sesame Street? And I said, oh yeah. And she says, you remember that song, one of these things is not like the other? <laughs> I said, yeah, I remember. She goes, some of those vines are not like the other. She goes, that's not how you grow great. I had, you know, I was, I was planting a row of Cab Franc and when I got to the end, I wasn't quite to the end of the row. I put concords in the in the row with it and <laughs> she kind of had to straighten me out a little bit i had i had a lot to learn well and you know the interesting thing about that isn't that it's just two different varietals you need an entirely different way to train those vines right you yeah. know for for whether you're in california and you don't grow these native or hybrid varietals native american vines 
grow down. Right, umbrella and, system typically. Exactly, yeah. and and vinifera grow up. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I mean that. One of the things I had to learn. <laughs> did you end up pulling the concord out? I or? did. I I moved them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I had a couple other situations like that as well. So, yeah, I mean, they're just you know, and it touches on what I want to talk more about the collaboration among people in the wine industry because yeah. I had so much help from so many people and I, and I needed it, but it was, it was great. And I feel like today, I mean, we just celebrated our 10th year of our winery license this year. Um, my skill set has really gone up a lot since I started, which is kind of, kind of neat, but I have a lot of people to thank for that. Yeah. One of those is a mutual mentor in Johannes Reinhardt mm-hmm. over at Kemeter. Yeah. Uh, he is a gem to have in this region. And Johannes comes from Germany, a family of grape growers in Germany, decided to strike out on his own Mm -hmm. in the new world, so to speak, and at Anthony Road, and now he has Kemeter. And that's just around the corner from you as well. It is. It's right next door, yep. And I, the last couple harvests, I've worked and helped Johannes a little bit. He often comes and takes a walk through my vineyard and gives me some ideas. And uh, one of the things I got going on right now, I'm doing some cluster thinning, and it's I learned it from Johannes. I mean, he's very you know, focused on having good quality fruit. And I feel the same way. It's not about how much wine I make. I want to make the best wine I can make. And to do that, I feel like I need to have really high quality fruit. He has this, um, are you familiar with epigenetics? This idea that uh, encoded in DNA is memory. Okay. And there are things that maybe even if we're never taught, we know because our ancestors knew it. Mm. Uh, and I often think like he is a case study in epigenetics. Because that, that, I can see your point. I can see your he point. just knows, mm-hmm. like just knows grape growing, winemaking. Uh, obviously, he's done a lot of work to get to that point as well. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to cluster thinning, uh, I always remember his rule, six leaves per cluster. Mm-hmm. You need to make sure that you've got that photosynthesis right. to ripen that fruit. Yeah. Let me tell you a story about one of the first times I had, I had been making wine a couple of years and I asked Johannes if he would come and taste my wines. And he said, oh, sure. And he, you know, he gives you that stern look. He says, I'm going to be honest with you, he says. <laughs> and I said, I want you to be. So he shows up, and I greeted him in the driveway. And he says, well, let's take a walk in the vineyard. And Because uh, I had glasses set up inside and wines ready to taste. And he said, let's take a walk in the vineyard. So we walked the vineyard, and he started pointing some things out. And I, I was kind of surprised because I saw him as a winemaker. Mm-hmm. And I finally had to say, Johannes, how do you know so much about growing grapes? And he told me the story about at home in his you know home family vineyard back in Germany that he managed the vineyard for a lot of years and, and it just blew me away. It's like, I mean, he's such a good winemaker and yet he knows so much about growing grapes. And it started to help me make that connection that yeah. you grow good wine, you really do. And right. and and he's taught me a lot about that. The uh, we've had great opportunities to have some of the world class German winemakers in here. Uh, Johannes, I, I can't wait to have him on. Mm -hmm. eventually Uh, but one of the things I love about the German approach is they call it wine growing Mm -hmm. you know it's not grape growing right and it's because you know the end product you want to make starts in that soil where that vine is growing right Um, it's weird how language and nomenclature impacts the way we think about a product but Mm -hmm. I think we as as a region and, and as Americans would actually be better served in our wines by mm-hmm. by calling ourselves wine growers and not grape growers. I definitely believe that. Um, you know, I've worked Harvest the last 10 years with Peter Bell at Fox Ron. Peter is a phenomenal winemaker. Mm-hmm. I work with Nancy at Red Tail a little bit. And I've seen both of them purchase grapes that were maybe not of the highest quality and make a respectable wine out of those grapes. And I feel like I don't want that as part of my resume. Yeah. I, I I want to grow the best grapes I can grow because then it makes it much easier to make high quality wines, I think. When we had Paul Brock in here, that's exactly what he said. He's like, I don't want to help you fix your wines. I want to help you grow better grapes. Exactly. (laughs) And and that's, I feel good that, you know, I've only been doing this, you know, I think this year will be my 13th harvest, um, which is, you know, very young, very new to the, to the field. But I'm glad I'm picking up on that very early on. And uh, it, it makes a big difference, I think. It does. And when we talk about harvest in the Finger Lakes, another point to drill home is 13 years sounds like a lot of time to people who may not be in the industry. 
if you if you're a plumber for 13 years you're gonna have a pretty good sense of what plumbing is right when you're talking about the finger lakes we we have to drill down and talk about the difference in the growing seasons mm-hmm. because no two are alike exactly I mean you've had some pretty severe growing seasons I remember talking with you in the wake of 2014 in the mm-hmm. polar vortex yeah uh, some of the cold damage. Yeah. Uh, 2018, the zombie apocalypse. Uh, yeah. You know, and then. The sour uh, rot year. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, and then, good Lord, whatever 2020 brought, which was really nice fruit and a mm-hmm. really bad year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, part of the decision of growing grapes in the Finger Lakes then is making sure that you're choosing the varietals that can align with what our climate will deliver to us. What grapes are you growing right now, Todd? Okay, so I have two whites. I have Riesling and I have Gruner Veltliner. And then reds, I have Cabernet Franc, I have Lemberger, and I do call it Lemberger. I know some people don't. Uh, And I have a hybrid called Marquette. So the Marquette is interesting because this was a hybrid released by the University of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. I've read reports that it's cold hardy all the way down to what, like negative 40? Negative 30 something, Yeah, yeah, it's great. No matter how cold winter gets, I know it's going to be there every spring. Exactly. And from a winemaking perspective, and I think this is especially important for people who don't live like you, like right next to Seneca Lake, prime vineyard location. Mm -hmm. Marquette can make a delicious, great dark red wine, and it can be grown like all the way up into the Adirondacks, (laughs) you know? Exactly. So for New Yorkers, for cold climate regions around the country, or regions that have some pretty intense swings in temperature. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is a really good grape to grow. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm glad I have it. Um, I've been a fighter as a dry red for a number of years, and it was okay. I didn't, I didn't think it was very complex. You know, um, some people liked it, but uh, at a suggestion of uh, August Emil from, at the time was at Cuca Spring, now he's at Constellation. He had said he experimented with it when he was in school as a rosé, and so I. I gave it a try, and, and I still make it into a rosé today. I, I really enjoy the rosé that it makes. It's it's a very high acid grape. There's, there's some challenges with it, but I think it makes a, a nice uh, representation of rosé, and I also make it into a ruby-style port. Nice. I haven't had that one yet. Yeah. Um, I make some Marquette. It goes into my hybrid red blend. Okay. Um, and I've done it as a blend with uh, for rosé, um, but with other hybrid reds. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that's unique about it is how early it ripens. Oh, yeah. So for people who aren't familiar in California, you're picking caps off at 24 bricks, it's fine, right? We don't usually see 24 bricks on anything but our late harvest wines. Right. Uh, you know, so what's interesting about Marquette is it's also like the first grape most of us will harvest mm-hmm. for winemaking. Yeah. Uh, it, I've seen it ripen as early as late August. Exactly. So what is cool about that is it gives us this other window to make some unique products too. I've tasted some Marquette Nouveau, mm-hmm. which was really compelling. Yeah. Um, and I did a small trial in our winery, uh, pulling off some Marquette uh, for a red ferment mm-hmm. before it had finished fermenting targeted you know that uh, right around 20 grams rs Mm -hmm. and we let it finish fermenting in the bottle so it was sort of a kind of a pet nat yeah red and i'll tell you what we had that at thanksgiving it was amazing that's cool so we might we might take that into production this year we'll see that's nice (laughs) yeah um i was in a vineyard this morning and marquette is the version is is underway it's starting to change color already so wow um time to get the bird nets on and things like that but And I, you know, making the two different wines that I make with it, um, I don't want a high alcohol rosé, so I harvest it usually around between 21, 22 bricks. Marquette will get very high in sugar. And if I'm making port, it'll go to 24, 25, so. Nice. Which is unusual compared to vinifer in New York. That doesn't happen. No, no, we'll be picking, I I push our Cab Franc as much as possible and usually pick around 22. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. But but that's not every year. Right. Exactly. Um, let's talk about Lemberger because okay. I've only worked with it a uh, couple times. Mm-hmm. I love the grape as well. And I call it Lemberger mm-hmm. kind of a hat tip to Fox run and Anthony road. Yeah. You know, they started off with these cab Franc Lemberger blends mm-hmm. years ago. Yeah. 
And I think that these two varietals work so well together, kind of marrying some of that green pepper from the Cab Franc with some black pepper from the Lemberger. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also known as Blau Frankish. Right. For me, I did not need another word on my <laughs> tasting menu that people had a hard time pronouncing. Gewurztraminer is hard enough. Right. Um, but has that done really well for you? Yeah, it, it's a nice grape to grow. It uh, Nice big berries, big clusters. Um, and it makes a, a nice medium-bodied dry red wine uh, with some nice, like you say, a little black pepper uh, characteristic to it. Um, I know it's my wife's favorite red. Yeah. But she, it's her go-to red. We we really enjoy it. And I do make a Cab Franc Lemberger blend as well. Uh, we call ours Travis Red only because we live on Travis Road. Yep. Pretty ingenious <laughs> of me, right? Yeah. Um, but you're right. Those two grapes blend very well together, and uh, it, it makes a beautiful wine. So now let's talk about some of those whites. Uh, obviously a no-brainer to grow Riesling mm-hmm. in the Finger Lakes. Yep. I I believe we can grow Gruner Veltliner well. Uh, and this is not, uh, uh, you know, to discredit any of the wineries making it, but I just haven't tasted any that I was personally compelled to say, I need to buy a case of this mm-hmm. and cellar it. Yours, though, is really, I mean, vintage after vintage, absolutely delicious, Todd. So in growing Gruner Veltliner, what was the decision to plant that? Um, first of all, thank you for the compliment. Uh, I first tasted Gruner, I think it was at a chamber event with the Yates County Chamber back in like 2009 or 10. It was Dr. Frank's. Mm. It was one of the first ones I ever tasted. And I thought it was pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I like Riesling, but it's it was another white that's a little bit different than Riesling. And I thought I'd kind of give it a try. So I planted, started planting some in 2011. And uh, it's, you know, you say it grows well here. It it can. It doesn't like winter as yeah. much as some of our other vinifera. Um, I've had some years, you mentioned like 2014, where there was a lot of winter loss. Yeah. Um, but I learned something about this grape every year, and I I really like the wine that it makes. I think it's a real exciting wine. It is. So I was on the way back from uh, Toulouse with my wife. We were in Paris. We had a, a layover. And we just happened to start talking to the folks next to us. And mm-hmm. She was from New York City. Uh, and when you kind of came to our background, talked about, you know, winemaking, wine growing. And she said, oh, I love wine. I, she was kind of old school, right? Mm-hmm. So she hadn't tasted much of what has been coming out of New York in probably two or three decades. Okay. And so I could tell, you know, she was sort of like, ah, they're not really, you're not really making real wine, are you? <laughs> you know? And then she, the conversation moved. I was convincing her that, yeah, we are. And she says, well, you know, my favorite wine, it's one that they don't even grow in the U.S. And I said, oh, what, what is that? She said, well, it's Gruner Veltliner. I said, you really do need to explore the Finger Lakes because mm-hmm. I have a friend who's making some great Gruner, mm-hmm. you know, 200 miles away from you. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. No, that's interesting. Yep. Um, now, the winery, is that at the bed and breakfast? It is. Um, it's funny. We give... When we do our tastings, we do it out on our crush pad, and we give people a little tour of the vineyard. And I and I tell them, you know, where you're sitting, this is where we set up our crusher juice dumber and our press, and mm-hmm. I run a hose across the lawn and pump juice into the basement of the house, and, you know, that's how we make wine. And they, they all kind of get a kick out of that. But it is. It's right there in, on the property, yeah. So, and just for anybody listening, like, this is the most, this, this is technically then home winemaking. <laughs> yeah, um, we are... As far as I can tell, we're the smallest farm winery in the Finger Lakes. Uh, we only have one acre of grapes, and we make about 300 cases of wine a year. So pretty so small. It's small, but it's serious. Yeah. Um, and to me, like, so again, not to, to bring up Europe too much, but one of my favorite things about the European thinking, especially once you get out of, like, the really big regions, you know, I'm mm-hmm. not talking, although this happens there too, but it is small family wineries you know they're living there like this is part of their livelihood they oftentimes are farming other things and Mm -hmm. when you're tasting you're tasting in the barn and you know one of the family members is in the kitchen watching you while they're cooking dinner right uh what it does to me is it ties you even closer to the land it it gives you that greater sense of like this person is a steward Mm -hmm. not just uh pursuing a career you know yeah I think that's important. And what I love about the fact that you have both the kind of the bed and breakfast and the winery on site 
is like that is what the Finger Lakes is about. You know, that is that is true hospitality. It is also understanding like I get to see this process all the way through, Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So do you do you give uh, you give tours to guests who are staying there? Um, Do you ever have anybody who has come back and say, like, that really sparked my interest. I'm I'm going to do the same thing or I'm going to plant the vineyard. Um, we've had some people that have expressed interest in uh, maybe growing some grapes after seeing our place. Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, I guess we're the true definition of agritourism because, yeah. because that's what we have. Um, it, it's a neat arrangement. It really is. Um, and I, and I kind of set the vineyard up. You know, we have grass row middles, so we encourage our guests. You know, you go to other wineries, they say, keep out, you know. <laughs> yep. Walk in the vineyard, enjoy it. It's it's beautiful. I mean, it's, it's just something spiritual about having a, a, a vineyard in your backyard. Yeah. And we want our guests to experience that. So it's pretty neat. So before we sat down for the interview, uh, and I actually received a call yesterday from Brad Holland, who's a, a pretty renowned chef in the region. He's super creative. We were talking about some ideas he has. Um, but you were cluster thinning, as you mentioned. Yeah. And ordinarily, when you cluster thin, uh, as long as everything's healthy, these you know, grapes that aren't going to ripen end up just on the vineyard floor. Right. But he's got this product, uh, again, sort of a callback to what people used to do rather than just letting that fruit rot on the floor, mm-hmm. uh, called Verjuice. So he, he picked that up from you yesterday? Yeah. Um, I talked to Brud before I started cluster thinning the gruner and just asked him if he had any interest and he said he would love it. So we are, Harvest has actually started at New Vines because we're <laughs> picking grapes, putting them in boxes. Um, and Brud's picking them up, and he's going to make verjuice with it. So, so verjuice is, um, I mean, think about it like this. Uh, grapes right now are going through rapid cell division. Right. They're growing. But outside of that Marquette, which has started Beraisin, there's no sugar production. Mm-hmm. So they're in this mode where they're producing a lot of tartaric and malic acid. When you press that, and it's not an easy press because they're like, they're you know, hard. They're very hard. But you get what is essentially like uh, like a high acid, almost vinegary esque kind of flavor profile. It tastes mm-hmm. like lemon juice at times. Yeah. But it's this great way to bring a citrus profile to the foods we're cooking without being able to grow lemons in the finger legs. Right. Yeah. Um. I always tell people, you know, we use it as a salad dressing. Yeah. And typically, if you're using oil and vinegar on your salad, you know, you kind of have to slide the wine glass away because you can't drink wine with vinegar. <laughs> But when you use verjuice, uh, you keep on drinking wine with your salad because it, it goes along pretty well. Definitely. Uh, the other thing, so kind of transitioning out of, of vines for the moment, you're talking about culinary stuff. You mm-hmm. you love gardening too, right? I do. Yes. Yeah. Uh, when did that passion start? Well, I have I have five brothers, so um, growing up in a family where my dad didn't make a whole lot of money garden was real important to us having food on the table so we had a very large garden um and i'm i'm number three of six so i guess i was one of the ones that was kind of in charge of a lot of the gardening and and i just really enjoyed it i mean you know maybe parts of it weeding and something wasn't that much fun but (laughs) growing things really gave me some satisfaction and and so um i guess i have to thank my parents for that and uh i still still love doing it we keep a big garden um, a number of years ago at Fox Run, they, they wanted to have some local produce for their cafe. So I built a little garden off of their parking lot area that I take care of. And then we have a big garden at home, and some of it's overflow that, you know, a lot of it we use at the bed and breakfast, and then some goes to the cafe at Fox Run as well. So it all gets used, and, and our neighbors uh, get to share in some of the bounty as well. Yep. So I've talked about this a lot on the show, but gardening is what sparked my my passion for wine Mm -hmm. and I always encourage folks you know if you are interested in wine on a deeper level just start growing a a garden at home because you're going to learn so much more about what it takes to grow good grapes even by growing cucumbers oh yeah um I remember my first experience I was I had to have been like four or five and I picked up a packet of seeds carrot seeds and I literally, you know, you, you, just a little kid, I threw some in a, in a planter. Mm-hmm. And I remember coming back in probably about two months. And they were baby carrots, but there were carrots mm-hmm. there. I mean, this, for, for my little mind, like opened up this whole world of just excitement. Yeah. And uh, later that year when we carved our pumpkins, 
I threw a bunch of the seeds in a planter again, just planter bed, you know, mm-hmm. and then seeing uh, the plants come up next, you know, that next spring yeah. was, so that's what sparked my interest in it. Uh, we have a garden at the winery. I have a garden at home. I, I love it too. Yeah. And this has been a bumper year. Speaking of cucumbers for cucumbers, we've had a lot of rain. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm at the point where I've probably canned more than 20 jars of pickles and they're just still coming out my ears. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned Brett Holland, uh, Samantha Biscus, another local mm-hmm. chef. Uh, she just stopped by the other day and I gave her some cucumbers to make pickles and along with some other produce. So, um, yeah, it, it the garden's doing pretty well. One of the cool things that we do, uh, just the other day we had a house full of guests and, you know, Danny said, I'm going to make a frittata for breakfast tomorrow morning. Yeah. And so I go out and dig potatoes out of the garden and pull leeks out and it all goes into the next morning's breakfast. It's like, it's amazing. And people just go crazy about that. Oh, I love it. My wife um, made some uh, fried zucchini patties for dinner oh, nice. the other night. Oh my gosh. So good. Yeah, I know. <laughs> We're getting a lot of zucchini as well. So, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the growing season. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when you're growing grapes, you're more attuned to the weather than ever. The other thing about it is, you know, it's funny because a lot of times customers will just come into the tasting room and it's been kind of a nice summer and they always expect you to say everything's perfect. I've learned that in farming, you always have a reason to complain, right? <laughs> like it's too dry, it's too wet, it's mm-hmm. too cold, it's too hot. Um, this growing season so far started off amazing, mm-hmm. uh, except for that little bit of snow that we got in April that was kind of a surprise, and, and we were worried about our buds at that point. Everything worked out great. Right. The last couple of weeks have been really challenging, though. Mm-hmm. Um, what is it that you're seeing in the vineyard? What are the challenges you think we're facing right now? Yeah, I think um, bud break this spring was was one of the earliest I can remember. It was several weeks earlier than last year. Um, and things started off really well. The, we were kind of dry for a while. So mm-hmm. then the initial rains we got were very helpful, I thought. Um, but then it continued to rain and rain. So ideal conditions for downy mildew. And I know I have some of that going on. I've got it you know, pretty much under control. But you know, one of the common things you fight with grapes because they're very susceptible to molds and mildews. And when you get those damp conditions, it, it's conducive to that kind of thing. But I mean, that, that's part of growing grapes. I mean, you just got to, you know, the things you learn, how to take care of stuff. Um, it, it's just part of the fun of, of, of growing wine. It is. And, and this is, so this is how I make that leap for customers uh, between growing that zucchini plant and growing grapes. Mm-hmm. Uh, when, in fact, just yesterday, I was sitting on our patio talking with some customers and they said, you know, it was so beautiful. We were at a different winery. We were looking out over some vineyards to the lake. And then there's a tractor coming through spray and stuff like what was that and so i explained you know do do you grow zucchini at home yeah yeah uh have you ever seen kind of that white stuff on the leaves and then they turn brown and shrivel up and your zucchini crop's not going to come in Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah well the same thing can happen with grape leaves and Mm -hmm. that's powdery mildew yeah uh and it puts it in perspective so i uh i i can't hammer it home enough i do think that's important yeah what about wine? When did you first fall in love with wine? Uh, and what was it that made you dedicate a lot of time to, to doing this? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Um, it's funny, I, I didn't think about it at the time, but my mom is Italian. My Italian grandfather used to make some wine. And we had some wild, some Concord vines out back, and he would actually, you know, we'd pick up grapes, and he he would turn it into wine, and we had a barrel to keep in the garage, and yep. and you know I didn't think much of it as a young kid, but um, now it, it kind of makes a, an impression on me that it's again it's a generational thing, you know, it was something that was in our family. Um, but I guess we, you know we just had a, a love of wine early on, I mean, and we went through the sweet wine phase. My wife and I, we would yep. we would come down here and pick up some of the Kool Aid and you know enjoy it, and finally your palate starts to mature a little bit, and it takes time, but. Um, I don't know if there's any one wine experience that really stands out to me. Um, I, I think maybe it is that transition when you can, I can remember we went to Dr. Frank's when you, we used to taste in the barn yeah. back in the, I think it was the late eighties or early nineties. And, um, 
you know, we thought, oh, we don't like their wines. They're kind of dry, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and now, you know, you, you know, you come to the realization that, you know, that that's how we best enjoy wine is like that. That's how, how you enjoy it in the culinary experience or anything else. But not, not to take the, anything away from people that enjoy sweeter wines. There's still a, a lot of people that do that. Yep. Um, and, there, you know, there's a big market for that. But um, I, I think that transition you make when you really start to appreciate uh, the complexity of a, of a nice dry wine. Yep. Another thing I was curious about is you opened the bed and breakfast. What was it like that first night, those first customers? Uh, I think there's a lot of us who, who enjoy staying at bed and breakfast, but we could never imagine operating one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, actually, our first guest was our builder. Yeah, um, we had a custom builder that built our home. We we designed it to be a bed and breakfast, and and he did a fantastic job putting that home up. And uh, he said he wanted to be our first customer, and he bring some friends to come. And so they filled the house, and I think he ended up building homes for for several of those people after they saw the house <laughs> he built for us. So, but that, it was kind of cool. Um, yeah, and again, you know, we decided to make this leap of faith to have you know this opportunity to live in a beautiful region, have room for our kids to come home. And we had no idea if we'd enjoy it or not, but, um, you know, week or, you know, week after week, get to meet new people, people from all over, you know, mostly around the U S but we've had some people from Europe and yeah. from, from far away places. And it's just, it's such an enjoyable experience. And, and people say that our friends say, how can you stand having people in your house? <laughs> and, uh, it's, we just get used to it. I mean, it's just, it, it's part of the experience and, it's fun. We we enjoy it. You definitely have to have a certain sort of. Uh, I I want to say a little bit of a social animal in you, mm-hmm. um, but it's I mean not in a derogatory way. Like the idea that most of us go home as a refuge, mm-hmm. and we can turn a breaker off. Right. And when you're operating a bed and breakfast, like going home means turning the breaker on. You yeah. Know? Right. Is, is that. A challenge yeah it is um and it's funny you say that i think i think both my wife and i are more introverted than extroverted we're probably not the classic fit for yeah. b&b operators but um i mean danny's really good at at talking to people and finding out about them and 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 you know i've i've kind of acquired some of those skills as well i, I mean you get to you get to just talk to people and and uh and, and learn about them and tell let them tell their stories and, and it's fun to hear that but it it is nonstop. It, yeah. It's a tough occupation because, you know, there's always somebody there. You, you know, you're up early making breakfast, um, and then they go off for the day, so you have a little time. But which is, you know, what Danny spends cleaning and things yeah. like that. And then we used to do an evening social where we'd pour some of our wines and put out some local cheeses, and and so then again you're socializing. And it wasn't until you know late at night when you close the door and you're finally by yourself. And yeah. we finally said, okay, we gotta we gotta cut this back a little bit here somewhere. We we need our time and things like that. So, um, but we, we we're balancing it. It's it's a balance with your personal life and your social life. So, yep. And it's seasonal here, it so is. it's you're not inundated all year long. We were kind of surprised. We thought it would be summer fall. It, there's people want to come year round. There really is. I mean, the early years we were open in the winter. Um, you get you know people for like you know valentine's day and things yeah. like certain occasions but um now we're only open pretty much june through no november yeah. and so yeah, yeah you get a break from it so so let me tell you i actually think the best bed and breakfast operators are more introverted yeah and some of that stems from my own experience mm-hmm. this was probably 2008 but my wife and i um went to a small bed and breakfast in France in a tiny little town called Villa, I think it was Villeneuve, and um, stayed on a farm. They, a, a huge chicken farm, but also they, they grew a lot of other crops. <clears throat> and these people were really nice, but really present mm-hmm. all the time. And it came time for, uh, for dinner. My wife and I wanted to go into town, but they had made a chicken dinner for us. Mm-hmm. And we're extremely insistent that we sit at the table with them. Wow. Uh, now, the chicken was wonderful, right? Mm-hmm. But it, it, was, it was a bit much. Yeah. Um, and I think just that understanding that uh, this isn't about you. This is about them. Yeah. And if, if 
they don't want to sit there and have dinner with you. They were a strange couple. Yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't force them. You know? that, that's an excellent point. It, um, you know, we, we want people to be comfortable and if they want to socialize, they can socialize. If they want to be private, they can be private and we don't want to force any of that. So I, I can understand what you're saying. It's good to just kind of be there if, yeah. if they want a, a social opportunity, but if they don't, that's perfectly fine. Speaking of, uh, what's basically the home farm, uh, any plans for chickens? Do you have any poultry or? No, we don't. Um, all of our products are local. Um, a guy I used to work with at the bus plant in Penyan has a chicken farm, and so we get our, our eggs from Penyan. Yeah. Um, and you know, our a lot of our bacon and sausage comes from Bostrom Farms here yeah. locally. Uh, again, a lot of garden stuff. So, and I want to paint a picture for people who maybe live in cities or uh, are aren't in a rural area. What is so amazing about living in a place like the Finger Lakes is even if some of these folks aren't your friends, there are kind of roadside stands everywhere. So you can always have access to good local produce. Uh, and on top of that, I mean, how many little stands for brown eggs can one region hold? But mm. there's a lot. There are, <laughs> yeah. Um, our guests ask us all the time where they can pick up produce and things. And, you know, we have a, a Mennonite neighbor right above us with a stand out and yep. you know, send them up there. Or like you say, down almost any highway around us there's there's roadside stands that have some really nice produce and here's the mind-blowing thing it's an honor system mm -hmm. so you drive up you choose what you want you leave your cash yeah. in the little bin mm -hmm. and uh you go on your way yeah. uh that is that speaks to two things i think one um trust and kind of the social cohesion of a region yeah. and two kind of circling back the camaraderie that we have here mm -hmm. uh, in the region. So camaraderie among among people, you know, being willing to operate a small home business that way, um, but then between businesses. So you've mentioned uh, Nancy uh, over at Redtail and Johannes over at Kemeter, mm -hmm. uh, and even August. Uh, you've got a really good relationship with Scott Osborne at Fox Run as well. Right. Were you surprised to see the level of cooperation in the Finger Lakes among producers? Um, I don't know if I was, if it's surprising. Um, it's certainly, you know, welcoming. Uh, like, like I stated, you know, when I started out, I needed a lot of help. And there were people there offering help. And, and, and it just, it's amazing to me, you know, it, it's not just mine. I see it, you know, from winery to winery, um, vineyard to vineyard. The collaboration in this region is amazing. It really is. Um, it it makes me so proud to be a part of that industry because of, you know, what, what takes place. I can give you a classic example. You know, with a one-acre vineyard, um, buying chemicals for pesticides, you know, I need to spray six ounces of something for downy mildew, and it comes in a two-and-a-half-gallon jug that costs $600, yeah. you know. And it's like it's cost prohibitive, you know. Um you know, I can go to John Kaiser at Fox Run, their vineyard manager, and and John, you know, can we split some of this product, or can we share some costs, and and or Peter Martini down at Anthony Road, yeah. you know, or Johannes, or or Mike Kalizzi at Kashan yeah. Glen, um, you know, we've we've shared Mike Schnelli at Redtail. It, it's it's amazing to me that I don't know how I could survive without it. I really don't. It, yeah. It's just um, amazing that people are there for you. They're willing to help you, and it. It, it just makes life so much easier. Yeah. And that translates to winemaking as well. When it came to deciding, okay, you, you got a lot to learn, but you planted the grapes. Mm -hmm. A few years, years later, now you've got some grapes to make wine. Yeah. Did you do any formal training, or was it really just with the help of those of us around here? Yeah, I guess, you know, mine was a lot of experiential learning. Um, I did take a few classes at Cornell. Uh, which helped me a lot, you know, wine analysis, learn some of the chemistry and things like that. Um, but a lot of it is just working with other winemakers. Um, mm. I I, I got to give, you know, kudos to Peter Bell. I've, yeah. I've worked hard with him the last 10 years. Uh, he is a great teacher. He really is. And I've learned so much from him. Um, it, it's amazing sometimes. We were on a, I think we were at, participating in a webinar with, with a bunch of other winemakers. And, and some of them were asking questions about, how you do things, and I'm thinking, well, Peter's taught me that, yep. and then something I was, well, Peter's taught me that, and it, you know, it's just, it, you know, I'm f so fortunate to, 
you know, be friends with him and, and learn from him. And he's really had a huge impact on my, on my winemaking skills. Yeah. Uh, and the things that he holds in his head, I remember one time, uh, cause you, you always confront different issues mm-hmm. and you know, hopefully you learn from whether it's a mistake or you want to do something new. Um, I, I wanted, I had a Riesling that, uh, had basically, it had finished. It, it was where it was. It was just, it was a small lot, like a 70 gallon variable. Mm-hmm. Right. And I thought, you know what? I actually want to push this to dryness, but the sulfur was too high at this okay. point. So all you've got to do is call Peter Bell and he's like, oh, this is the formula for adding some hydrogen peroxide. Right. You know? and, right. and it's like in his head, I, I don't keep things like that in my head. Right. I keep them in books and then mm-hmm. I can reference them. Um, but he is an encyclopedia of he knowledge. He's a, he's a resource to a lot of winemakers. He really is. Uh, and it, I like the fact that, you know, he definitely helps me, but he lets me make my own wine. Yeah. Um, you know, he's taught me how to make wine, but he never he never pushes me to make wine the way he makes wine. And, yeah. and some of my wines are very different than some of the ways he makes wine. Yeah. But it's uh, he's 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 there to help. Um, he'll answer questions, but it's your wine. You you make it the way you want to make it. So, yeah. which is kind of nice. Uh, as far as the trajectory of the Finger Lakes, so ten years having a bed and breakfast means you see a lot of people coming through. Mm-hmm. How has bookings? Uh, how have they changed? Uh, how has your clientele changed in the way they look at wines in general and Finger Lakes wines in particular over the last decade? Um, interesting question. Um, of course, you know, last year we didn't open at all the bed and breakfast due to the pandemic. So we just opened up again here this June. Mm -hmm. And I think people are very anxious to travel. And a big part of our business is repeat referrals. So we see people, probably 70, 80% of our business is people that have stayed with us before Mm -hmm. or someone that stayed with us told them, told them about us. And, uh, I think they love coming to the Finger Lakes. I really do. Um, we did see a few new travelers here so far since we've been open. Um, I think maybe that some of the restrictions of the pandemic about people traveling overseas probably brought more downstate people to the Finger Lakes, uh, which is nice to see. People are just blown away by the beauty here. You know, I mean, they, yeah. they really appreciate it. Um, there is a great appreciation for our, our wines. Um, you know, people come from Ohio right right in their their wine belt there in in northeast ohio and they still come i mean they have wineries all around them and they still love to come and, and buy new york wine so i think there's a I, um i'm not sure if i'm answering your question well but no definitely i mean we have seen some growth um with that yeah so i i want to come back to this real quick COVID 19 as a bed and breakfast operator I mean, you, you know you're closing, but mm-hmm. I'm sure you had a ton of bookings. How did you handle? Yeah, we um, we basically had to. Uh, Danny called up everyone and, and you know apologized that we had to cancel the reservation. Um, there were a lot of them. There really were, yeah. and it was interesting because some of the people actually thanked her for canceling it. I mean, they they were leery about traveling. You know, a lot of unanswered questions. People didn't know what to do, and and so most of them were appreciative of the fact that we decided to to cancel and close. Um, and we, and we made that decision early on. We couldn't have been open, but then at the point we could have opened, um, it was more, you know, our own personal safety and health, our families, you know, yeah. our kids wouldn't come and see us if we were going to have strangers there the day before kind of thing. And, you know, there's so many unknowns going on. So I think it was a good decision. You know, it was a challenging year financially, yeah. but, um, we, we were happy and we think we made the right decision. Yeah. So with, One acre of grapes on the heels of of really the the shock of what 2020 meant to tourism, especially bed and breakfast. Mm -hmm. Uh, Are there plans to grow the winery, Todd? Yeah, people ask me that. Um, I don't have any plans to expand. Uh, You know, it's it's something I can manage myself. I mean, basically, Danny and I do everything until harvest, and then we'll get some friends help us pick grapes. But... um, if it got much bigger, then I get into, you know, I'm going to have to hire help and, and, you know, yeah. get, go down a different road. So, and we can talk about sustainability. I don't know if a one acre winery is economically sustainable or not. Um, there's no question that the bed and breakfast has carried us financially, but, 
but last year created a nice opportunity because with that closed, uh, we started doing public tastings and getting some more exposure. And that's one of our goals is to to build our winery brand a little bit, get more people to know our wines. Because for years we sold all our wines to our bed and breakfast guests. So yeah. you know, we still, just last week, had somebody come that is local and like, we never knew you were here, you know? Yeah. And so it's it's a nice opportunity for us. Uh, we built we built a great brand for lodging, and we, we kind of want to do the same for our wines is what our goal is. It was nice to see, uh, you know, tasting room signs mm-hmm. go up last year. Um, th- it, you know, for, for years, the only way that anybody would have tasted your wines is if, one, they knew you, or two, they stayed at the bed and breakfast. Exactly, yeah. But now having that sort of public accessibility mm-hmm. um, opens it up. So I just think it's so cool, Todd. Like, you're the guy who farms it. You're the guy who makes the wine. There's really no other hands involved in that process aside from, you know, friends and family that help out. Right. Uh, it is a true micro winery. Mm-hmm. You know, in a lot of ways, like, your Gruner Veltliner is the ultimate Finger Lakes unicorn wine, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's affordable, and you ship too, right? We do. Um, yeah, we signed on with Vino Shipper, so we can ship to 38 states. And, and so, you know, we don't, we don't get a lot of orders, but um, yeah. we do. You know, it, it's tough being small in some ways because, like, we, we talked about maybe having a wine club or something like that, but I'm afraid we'd run out of wine and wouldn't be able to supply it, you know. Yeah. So we're just going to keep doing what we do. You know, we'll, we'll make our 300 cases and, you know, sell them to our guests and sell them out the back door and whatever. And, and you know, we're in a couple of restaurants. Uh, um, Ports and Sepalta both carry our Gruner Veltliner. Nice. So, yeah, it's it's kind of popular. So, uh, in case you don't know, my passion is making sparkling wine. Mm-hmm. Have you considered making any sparkling? Yeah, I have not. Um, I like having a glass of bubbles once in a while to celebrate something, but I'm, I'm more of a still wine person, and so I, I don't think I'm going to go down that road. Yeah. And, but I, you know, I'm glad that people like you do because when I'm looking for some, it's always nice to... I can go next door to Nancy or come to your place or, or Fox Run and, and get a bottle of bubbles. So. Yep, yep. Well, let's not delay in tasting these wines. Okay. You brought two today. Yep. I'll grab them. Okay. So we have your Gruner. Mm-hmm. And I like the new label, too. This was a change from, what, two, two, three years ago? Yeah, I think in 2017 we updated our label. It's funny, our, our younger son, Adam, made a comment. He says, Dad, your wines are pretty good. He goes, but I would never pick your bottle up off a shelf in a, in a store <laughs> because the label just is unappealing to me. And and so we kind of collaborated and came up with a, a new label design. Um, it's funny that I'm more of a traditional label person. I like a clean, kind of a neat-looking label. I'm not into artsy labels and things like that. So it is a pretty clean label. Um, and, and I remember somebody asked me about the trellis a picture of the trellis on yep. our on our label. Uh, I actually had a friend that I worked with on a couple of projects many years ago who's since died of breast cancer mm. that designed that, that trellis for me. And so it has, you know, some an emotional connection for us. And uh, as that there's actually four little vines there and we have four children and so mm-hmm. it, it's kind of significant. So yeah, but thank you for noticing the label. It I think it's a nice label. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so we've got the Gruner. And what vintage was this? This is a 2020. Boy, again, you've hit it out of the park yet again. I, I just love the aromatics bouncing off the mm-hmm. glass. Yeah. I got to tell you a story about Gruner. So I it might have been 2013, the first vintage we had. And um, I kind of liked where it was going, and, and I haven't changed a whole lot in all these years. And, and like you mentioned earlier, it seems like vintage after vintage, this this wine comes out pretty well. Um, after I'd been making wine for probably about five or six years, I guess I was looking for a little validation. You know, people tell you, yeah, you're making good wine, but I kind of wanted to, to get some third party kind of reinforcement of that. So I entered, uh, some wines in, in a competition. Um, I know I always like to support the New York Wine and Grape Foundation. So they do the, the New York Wine Classic. Yep. And so I, I entered some Gruner and some Riesling in that competition back I don't know, 2014, 2015, somewhere around there. And it's funny because Gruner wasn't even a category back then. It yeah. was, you know, you had to put in other white, yeah. you know. And and so, you know, you got your token bronze or silver medal or something. And, and it was like, 
it was kind of a letdown because I don't even know if anybody even knows what Gruner is, you know. So after a couple of years, they finally created a category for Gruner. I go, okay, now, you know, now this is kind of cool. So um, I entered it again. And I th again, I think it won a silver medal or something like that. But and it's okay. So now they awarded a gold to somebody, right? Yep. So now I can at least know what are they looking for. And I remember tasting the gold medal wine, and I thought, I'm not too impressed with this wine. I mean, and it kind of got me thinking that I don't think a lot of people know what Gruner is supposed to taste like here in the Finger Lakes, you know. Um, it's it's relatively new here, and there's about a dozen wineries doing it now in a, in a variety of styles. But you ask, you know, expert tasters, you know, what, which is the best one, and I don't know what they're basing their decision on. Are they comparing it to an Austrian Gruner, or, you know, I'm not sure what they're doing. So I've kind of, you know, I have enough people like you and Scott Osborne and, you know, Kim and Vinny at, at Billsboro just love this wine and yeah. want to trade for me all the time. And so I'm getting my reinforcement a different way. So, <laughs> so competitions are interesting. Um, in a decade in the wine business, I've probably entered three. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you're right. It is hard to, to really get a sense of what wine judges are looking for, mm -hmm. what you're being judged against. What is happening in that room in that moment? Right. Um, I'm not putting them down, but it, it is uh, it is interesting, sort of the dynamics at play. Right. It, it's a very subjective thing, and and there's no way to predict the outcome. I don't think, yeah. but, which is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And I I plan to continue to support you know that competition. Mm -hmm. I probably just won't enter Gruner. I'll enter something else. Yeah. That maybe people are more familiar with. You know, I've toyed with. Uh, we're really increasing the number of listeners of uh, the show and I've toyed with ways that we can we can grow this brand of viticulture that's uh, everything from working with people for you know maybe a print publication at some point uh, expanding online content and I've thought that maybe a wine competition uh, with a different sort of rubric would be interesting and perhaps, you know, you're not as focused on the gold medal, but a chance to come and sit down and talk about your wines, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. So we'll make sure we have a Gruner cate category if we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was my little pet peeve in the past. And I, and I mean, you know, it's, it's obviously not as recognized a white wine as a, as a Riesling or a mm -hmm. Chardonnay. Um, but it's still a, a pretty special wine. So the thing that it, it's funny to kind of bring it back to the competition talk um, this is Gruner Veltliner, and it tastes like it, but mm -hmm. it tastes like the Finger Lakes, too. Mm -hmm. um, there is something so, just to describe it as like tasting the view, I know that sounds strange, mm -hmm. but when you drink in the view of the Finger Lakes, particularly when the sky is blue and there's beautiful white cumulus clouds, mm -hmm. uh, and, and those days when the lake is still like, a mirror and yeah. it's reflecting those like there is something um that is almost like sensory uh like you can taste that view in and mm -hmm. to me that's what finger lakes wines often show so yeah. how do you explain this to the average customer i don't know you come here see if you get that same sense yeah but i i in a blind tasting would pick this out as a Finger Lakes wine. Mm -hmm. It is that perfect balance of freshness, moderate alcohol, great acidity. Yeah. Um, and then <clears throat> that is buffeted with like, you know, iconic Gruner Veltliner uh, profiles. Yeah. I, I prefer this kind of a lean, crisper style. Um, we, we pair it with seafood. It, it, oh, yeah. It's really good with like oysters or grilled salmon or something like that. It's, it's an excellent seafood wine. Yep. Because it also offers some depth, like it's not just acid driven. There is this uh, like herbal lemongrass mm -hmm. type note yeah. um, that comes through pretty prominently. Yeah, um, yeah. I love it. Yeah. I absolutely love it. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. So crop is doing okay this year. I yeah, um, Gruner crops pretty heavily. We we had a great learning experience in 2017. Um, it was the big crop year that everyone experienced, yep. but. Uh, you know, I thought, man, our canopy's strong. We're not going to have any problem. And, you know, lo and behold, it hit a wall and just, you know, got to about 18 and a half bricks and just wouldn't go anywhere. And 
and and we harvested some good fruit. It was just a, uh, you know, we learned too much fruit. Yeah. The way we learned it more was, I mean, the wine I made from it was still pretty good, um, but the vines had a lot of injury uh, coming through winter. Yeah. So we produced 140 cases of, of Gruner in 2017. By the way, uh, 70 of those cases went to Belgium. Oh, yeah. Um, we had uh, a woman named Senez who had done harvest at Fox Run. Yeah. Uh, she's a master of wine, and she also helped with our harvest, and she fell in love with that wine, and so... Yeah. Uh, it went to Belgium, which was kind of kind of exciting. Anyway, we did 140 cases that year. The next year, we did like 35. Yeah, I mean, the vines just struggled. And a great learning experience for me. You learn something every vintage, but you know, by overcropping those vines, uh, they were they struggled through winter, yeah. and we had a lot of winter injury. So um, last year, I think we hit the sweet spot. We did a a lot of cluster thinning, made about 70 cases of Gruner, um, and I think that's where we need to be. And that's what we're working on right now. We're trying to drop some fruit in time to, you know, get some really good quality fruit that's remaining. You know, that's an apt analogy. It's why I say viticulture teaches you how to live a good life because <laughs> nothing is free, mm-hmm. right? You don't just end up with 80 cases more wine without paying for it right. uh, down the road. Right. Exactly. Um, and so it speaks to how important balance is um, and, the old famous saying, moderation and everything. Yeah, I mean, the whole vine balance thing is something that I, I'm very much in tune with now. And it's kind of interesting that, you know, you probably heard that the Wine and Grape Foundation is going to start a yes. sustainability certification, which I think is awesome. Yep. But they're basing it on a vine balance thing, which I think is excellent. That's a great foundation for for sustainability. You know, I've had Ernie Lawson sitting in that chair saying, all of these people who say every vineyard needs to have two tons an acre to make great fruit they don't know what they're talking about right that it is about balance and so much of that stemmed from uh you know colder periods in europe where you needed to pare down to make sure you could actually ripen a crop Mm -hmm. different places different vines have different balance needs sure yeah that's something johannes has taught me as well you know you you kind of you know, start out with something in mind, but you have to make adjustments throughout the growing season based yep. on your growing conditions. And and, and you got to keep your vines balanced. So it's really important. Exactly. Uh, you know, I was just thinking too, new vines, uh, they're still relatively new, but 20 years from now, you're going to change it to old vines? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, with, with a couple, re- my wife says we got to replant at least a vine or two every year so we continue to be new vines. So, <laughs> yeah. so usually, you know, with a few replants in there, we're still new vines. Yep. <laughs> All right, and now we're going to try the dry rosé. Yeah, and this is the dry rosé of Marquette, which is a little bit unique. Um, I think there's a couple of them around now. And this is 2020 as well. That is correct, yes. Beautiful color on that. What's your uh, your technique for getting your color? So so, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but Marquette is one of those tiny terrier grapes, so it's a red meated grape. Not not as red as like a Sabaravi or something like that, but so this is direct crush and press, no skin contact time at all. Mm. Um, the challenge with it is the high acid. Um, picking it at 21 to 22 bricks, typically the TA is still up over 12. Mm. So it requires some acid reduction, some you know manipulation in the cellar. Uh, and, the, and the color, although I, you know, I sometimes prefer rosés that have that nice pink hue to it this is more of a salmony color it's based on the ph basically um but we're kind of happy with this wine yeah no i mean some really great kind of raspberry notes again there's this interesting um like herbal quality but still with a lot of freshness Mm -hmm. like like fresh thyme yeah yeah you know overall Would you say you have a, a guiding philosophy in your cellar work? Yeah, um, my winemaking style is is kind of interesting. I guess um, I've especially working with Peter. Peter's, um, like I said, a good teacher. He's he's consistent in a lot of ways, but he's still an experimenter in some ways. And it's it's always interesting to watch the assistant winemakers that have worked with him over the years they want to try everything you know they want to throw the book at everything and just try this let's try that let's you know and maybe it's my age but i'm not an experimenter when it comes to winemaking i i mean 
I think there's enough variables in the growing season that you're, we're going to get that vintage variation, and I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. I don't want to add a bunch more variables to that mix. So I like to I like to find something that that I'm happy with the results, and then kind of stick with it, and let the growing season direct the change from year to year. But you know, when I find a yeast I like, I kind of stay with it. When mm-hmm. I when I find a process that kind of works for me, I don't. Not that I'm opposed to learning. I I'm still open to new ideas, but I'm not out there just let's try this and let's try that. I, I think there's enough variables. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, so is uh, the, the Gruner is obviously like a stainless steel profile. Yes. Um, any thoughts on doing any barrel fermenting on the Gruner? I have not. Um, I know Bob Medill has talked to me about trying to do some maybe Lee's contact and, yeah. and some skin contact type of things. And, and again, maybe just something that, um, I, I kind of like what I'm making now, so I'm yeah. not open to going for big changes to it. So, but I, I know other people will and at school and I'm, I'm happy to, you know, to taste those wines, Yeah. but you know, I, I kind of like the results I get. And so I'm kind of stuck in the mud right there, I guess. I don't know. Well, don't take that as me saying to change anything with the way you're making these wines. Mm-hmm. They really are fresh, delightful. Um, this is a great summer rosé yeah rosés are great um you talk about you know the how you taste the finger lakes and the beauty of the finger lakes and i think rosé is one of the ones that really paints that picture i mean sit by the lake on a sunny warm day and have a glass of rosé and you're you know it it just there's nothing like it i mean it's just so refreshing um you know this this to me is what summer is all about yep and you know unfortunately we're so used to and, and it it's kind of dictated by economics as well but we release our rosé you know hopefully if we can february march it's sold out by the end of summer Mm -hmm. but customers are rewarded with those wines if they wait a vintage or two i mean i'm drinking our 17 and our 19 rosé so 19 cab franc and 17 cab franc lemberger blend Mm -hmm. and i just wish we could get our heads around uh, back vintages of rosé are okay. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes that's what those wines need to take them to another level. They're yeah. just delicious. Yeah, that that's interesting because I, I personally don't, you know, think about, st- you know, shelving some rosé for later. Um, I Maybe because this is a hybrid grape, the Marquette rosé, um, I think towards the end of the summer, you know, the, the slight subtle changes that happen in the wine. I, th- I think it's best drink fresh and young, yeah. but I love Cab Franc Rosé and, and I can see how those would, you know, a year or two on them could really make them pretty interesting. Yeah, they are. They are. Well, Todd, I, I really have enjoyed having you in studio. Is there any sort of final words or thoughts you'd like to share? Yeah. Um, this kind of popped in my head the other day. Um, and matter of fact, you know, yesterday I had the opportunity to, to play golf with a neighbor and, and, you know, a couple of people that, that he works with. And, uh, I used to play golf before I grew grapes. I don't have time <laughs> for that anymore. So it was kind of a fun experience, but I brought a bottle of wine to each of the guys in the group and get, you know, gave him a bottle of wine. And I just think we take that for granted, but I think wine is something that as a gift, people really appreciate, you mm-hmm. know, I mean, it, there probably was a time when that wasn't so it's it as a gift it's something that's that's very appreciated and and i think that says something about this this time we're living in and this place we are it, it's just it's something about wine that it it people love it they just yeah. love it and it, and it's cool because i don't know if it was always like that but but right now it, it's a very much appreciated thing it's neat because it <clears throat> it is the exchange where you know, someone can express gratitude and be appreciative in the moment, but you know that there is a point later on and you don't know when it is that they're going to enjoy that for, uh, you know, whether it's a celebration, maybe there doesn't need to be a reason. Maybe it was a really bad day Mm -hmm. and it helps take that edge off. Yeah. I mean, you, you talked about the joy of making something and, and that's where, you know, I get a big sense of satisfaction from someone doing just what you say, you know, they, they got some enjoyment out of that bottle of wine. And, and I, I, I tell people all the time via social media, you know, send me your pictures of you enjoying our wines because it's so rewarding for me to see someone open a bottle of our wine and enjoy it. Yeah. 
Well, thanks again. I'm going to close this out. Okay. Thanks, Chris. This has been Viticulture, where we sat down with Todd Ikes of New Vines, Bed and Breakfast and Winery, to talk about agritourism and the enjoyment of life. Be sure to tune in soon. We've got some more great episodes on the way. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed this show. This has been Viticulture, where we share ways to cultivate a good life. Don't forget to visit our website at viticulturepodcast.com. Subscribe to our Substack, where you'll get show notes, transcripts, musings, and exclusive offers. And check us out on all the major social media platforms. Thanks again for stopping by.